Hello! First, I'd like to apologize to my subscribers for the long delay in making this video. A lot has happened personally and otherwise since my last video, which has taken my focus elsewhere. But, alas, it is important I continue on with this series, as it is still extremely important to me and to you that I continue. So let me begin part three of my series. The prevalence of adults claiming historical sexual abuse based on newly constructed memories is still on the rise. One major reason for this is unregulated, misguided, and undereducated therapists or counselors who take advantage of vulnerable, mentally unstable people. Most often, a patient who has already been diagnosed by a previous doctor with a clinical illness such as depression eating disorders, drug addiction, alcohol dependency, or even schizophrenia, and prescribed medications to treat them, will be the perfect mark for a subsequent therapist whose only interest is to keep their patient coming back week after week, month after month, ensuring profitable income for them. These therapists will lead the patient down the road of believing their mental illness is actually just a symptom of suppressed memories of childhood abuse. They do this by helping them construct memories using various hypnotic techniques, such as guided imagery and dream exploration. All therapists are also mandatory reporters by law, meaning if a child patient speaks of abuse during therapy, the therapist must call the authorities, such as Children's Aid Society or the police, to report the abuse and the name of the abuser the patient names during therapy. Consequently, if the patient is an adult and expresses fears their childhood abuser may be currently in a position to harm other children, the therapist may feel motivated to report the named abuser targeted during memory construction sessions. Many of these patients have brains that are functioning abnormally because of genuine clinical mental illness, temporary mental instability, or because of mind-altering psychotropic drugs they take recreationally, or medications they take as prescribed by their previous family doctor or psychiatrist. All of these clinical mental illnesses have been proven in scientific studies over and over again to be functional and structural abnormalities of the brain, hence the successful development of pharmaceuticals to target and manage them. Therapists are treading extremely dangerous waters when using hypnotic memory retrieval techniques that will produce harmful, unreliable, and likely false delusional memories of childhood abuse. Other controversial psychiatric diagnoses such as PTSD or complex PTSD or multiple personality disorder or dissociative identity disorder will equally pique the interest of therapists or counselors in the same way. Sometimes, however, it is the same therapist who believes the patient is a victim of childhood abuse from the get-go that diagnoses them with one of these controversial conditions. And sometimes these therapists don't diagnose but instead tell the patient that they are not mentally ill, rather a victim of childhood abuse, explaining and making sense of their inability to function normally, such as can't hold a job, or can't have healthy relationships, or can't get out of bed in the morning, or having horrible nightmares, or having body pains. It is important to note that in Canada, family physicians and psychiatrists can prescribe psychoactive drugs while psychologists, psychotherapists, therapists, counselors, and social workers cannot. It is also important to note that psychoactive and psychotropic medications are substances that alter brain function, mood, perception, and consciousness. So the following video clips uh, will show how a modern day Australian rogue therapist employs the memory construction technique and how it actually destroys lives rather than heals them. Eleven clients of the same therapist told Four Corners they had false memories of sexual abuse by their families. 
the therapist was Matthew Mike. There is a serious problem in the world that people in my position may get to see a little bit more of because people come to me. But that serious problem is sexual abuse. There's an awful lot of it going on. Mike is one of thousands of unregistered psychotherapists and counsellors working across the country, permitted to treat the vulnerable and the mentally ill without training or supervision. I've learnt through my own experiences and through working with thousands of people and getting great success this way, is that actually I don't even want to call myself a therapist, but really just a human being that understands that pain is a natural part of life. No, I've got no qualifications whatsoever. Yeah. Does that mean that you shouldn't be doing what you're doing? Are you safe to be doing what no, you're doing? I, I always had an aversion to qualifications. Over time, boundaries between client and therapist evaporated. He became a regular at birthdays, other social occasions, and even holidays. And his influence over some of them grew. Can you treat people who have recognised, diagnosed mental illness? My approach is very different. OK, so my approach is very different in the sense that what people have been conditioned into calling illness to me is a completely natural response to an event in your life. It's not wrong, it's not inappropriate, it's not even an illness, OK? There's like a, a, a dual personality, you know, where one, one part is a traumatised person and the other part is a person they, that the, the personality that the person uses in day-to-day -day life. There's great doubt that there is anything of the nature of repressed memories. The idea that memories are there that you do not know about, that can be legitimately raised this way, is highly doubtful. Most of respectable psychology and psychiatry these days would say it's not true, and it's not an idea that should be pursued. I would never encourage actually any of my clients to go to the police or go to any authority on the topic because of the trauma they would go through. That might not be acceptable for society, but I'm interested in the people I work with getting well. I'm not a policeman. <laughs> yeah. You need to be fucking people out of your life. You need to get your family out of your life so you can deal with this. So I think you'll find that once you settle all that down and get that restraining order in place, get all those things off your back and settle down again, quieten down again, I think you'll find things will start moving. That kind of powerful talk, powerful figure, insistive language, is the sort of situation you see in cult-like leaders, in people who will not raise the possibility of any dissent, of any disagreement, or that it can't be exactly how they say it to be. Do you encourage them to distance themselves from their families in order to recover or heal? Uh, in some cases, I would, yeah. We're all suggestible to some degree, but when you're distressed, when you're not so well, when you're fragile, you are very open to then having memories implanted, having the past reconstructed in ways that never occurred. It's For 20 years, Diamond has provided expert testimony to courts and police. He's using techniques that are aimed at building dependency, um, compliance, suggestibility, in the common term, mind control. Do you put people in a, in a position where they make things up in order to please you or satisfy you? Oh, no. <laughs> no, I'm... <laughs> when people... I mean, what, there would be no point in doing that to start with because I'm not really interested in people pleasing me or satisfying me. It's not really so much a prompting in the sense of verbal prompting. We know that memory is a, a notoriously unreliable uh, part of one's brain function. Let me ask, is it yeah. not true that you have prompted people to have false memories it's of rape and incest? Why would I do that? What would be the purpose or the benefit to me of doing that? Some of those people yeah. claim that you've destroyed their family life. Yeah, I'm not going down that track. You've led them to no, have I haven't absurd done memories that, that didn't true. take place that they, destroyed their I'm, family life. I'm not going down that track. I'm not interested in going down this track. If you want to, you've, you've come up, have you come here with false pretenses? Because if Certainly you have, not. this is stopping. You come out of regression thinking, oh my God, 
I was gang raped. How the hell did your body respond to that? It goes into shock. I could hardly breathe. I was shaking. I was sick. I could hardly speak. I was completely crippled as a person. Brittell Humphrey is a primary school teacher in Perth. For five years, she was under the influence of an untrained therapist who convinced her she had repressed memories of extreme sexual abuse. It was initially that my father had raped me when I was a child. Then it was that my mother and my um, brothers were involved. Where did he rape you? In the None of these memories was real. They were prompted by the therapist during intense one-on-one -on -one sessions. I would lie down on a cushion and he would sit at my head um, and almost like a hypnosis. Deep into your groin, inside your vagina, all around your bum, inside your bum. In this two-hour session, Mink prompts Brittell for memories of a supposed rape by her father and brother, watched by her mother. Is this the first time Darren's seen your father do this to you? I think so. Mm -hmm. And your mother, you said, is standing at the door looking, is she? Yeah. Brittell Humphrey's family was shattered. I don't think we're nearly, we're a family anymore. Um, it's, it's a big strain on everybody, I think. Um, yeah, it has been, yeah, huge. Brittell and her younger brothers, Ryan, Darren and Philip, grew up together on this property outside Perth. Two years ago, Ryan came home to tell his parents that Brittell had accused her father of sexual assault. It sounded a bit formal, and he had that worried look on his face, which I haven't seen. And I thought, oh, what's going on here? And he said that uh, Brattel says that uh, I'd raped her. There was somebody else apparently had um, raped her when she was little, and then Dennis from 5 to 15, and I knew all about it. Um, that was the start of it. Then it was that my mother and my... Um, brothers were involved. Then the next step was that my extended family had been involved and had all been raping me when I was a child. And then it progressed to believing that um, not just family, but pretty much everybody, <laughs> anybody that I was alone with would um, hurt me in some way. Two years ago, Brittell cut off all contact with Mike she now understands that all her recovered memories were false. How would you describe the state of mind that you were in at that time? Um, oh, I don't know if words could describe it, just uh, completely blind and completely um, under his spell. Just about right here. Other families suffered in the same way. Kathleen Kaczynski and her partner Ben are trying to maintain a normal life in the face of shocking allegations made against them by Kathleen's daughter, another one of Matthew Mike's followers. Stormy was 26 when she became involved with Mike five years ago. Her family found they were powerless to intervene. I went to people I know in the medical profession, in the psychology profession alike. Mm. And I kept coming up a blank. Mm. And, you know, I tried to say, what can we do? And there was nothing legal that we had disposable to us. Stormy has a mental illness. She was diagnosed with clinical depression at the age of 15. As that last bit shows, there is no recourse for the wrongly accused in these situations nor is there any real help for, for the vulnerable accuser who now wrongly believes that the most unimaginable crimes were perpetrated against them.
by their own parents. Often these vulnerable people keep these false memories as their story of what happened to them, their narrative, and they live the life of perpetual victimhood. Some of these people continue on to influence others to seek the same type of therapy. And they can also engage themselves in politics or victims' rights groups and have a hand in developing laws and public policies to further protect false victimhood. All around perpetuating this very unhelpful cycle of victimhood and devastating false accusations. Here in Canada, the government sanctions this type of victimhood. Victimhood is institutionalized within all government ministries and agencies. It is also a very profitable business for women and children advocate groups and less than savory lawyers who rely on big fat paychecks and feminists who rely on funding dollars. They will all fight tooth and nail to keep it this way. There are multiple ways that the state keeps the prevalence of this special type of justice out of the public eye. For example, routine publication bans on criminal sexual assault cases. Entire trials held secretly and closed to the public, also known as in-camera. The rare use of juries, mostly judge-only trials. The inadequate data collection specific to the number of adults claiming childhood sexual abuse, pressing charges, and their outcomes. In the UK, the BBC Four did an interview with some lawyers and psychologists discussing the very issue of historical sexual abuse cases going through the courts. They report many, many cases coming through the courts, many resulting in convictions, of course, some being dismissed and luckily acquittals. However, there are people who are convicted or have been convicted. They discuss the issue of specific data that they need in order to monitor these types of cases, the prevalence and the outcomes, which is not being collected by the state. We have the same problem here in Canada. We do not distinguish between adults telling tales of childhood sexual abuse and children telling tales of sexual abuse. So we also in Canada cannot definitively say how many cases go to the courts and what their outcomes look like. We can only estimate based on the stats that are available to us and by what other lawyers tell us. In the meantime, we do have the uh, luxury of this interview by BBC discussing this very topic, which we have yet to have here in Canada. So let's listen. When memory is your only evidence, can justice ever be done? Allegations of sexual abuse against children are among the most sensitive and difficult cases the legal system has to deal with, often relying on one person's word against another. But when those allegations go back decades... Each person's testimony is reliant on their memory. Now, with a raft of historical abuse cases continually going through the courts, there's concern within the criminal justice system that innocent people are going to jail. There is a new genre of miscarriages of justice in this country, and they're historic allegations. And they destroy lives. And we're now in a situation where the court, at its peril, is ignoring the issue about the reliability of memories. At the end of the day, it's just like playing Russian roulette with people's lives. There are cases where if the allegations are specific enough and those records clearly aren't available, then in those cases they shouldn't proceed. And too infrequently still, despite the Court of Appeal decisions, the Crown Courts are still not prepared to stop those cases. But stopping those cases, what does that say about the rights of people who are alleging that they have suffered terrible abuse and they want justice? The people that obviously have cases stopped will feel aggrieved at the system and feel let down. But one should never forget those people now who currently may be sitting in prison cells who shouldn't be there because their cases should have been stopped. There's always a balance in the criminal justice system, but we have to try and make sure that's a fair balance. We hope to talk to the Crown Prosecution Service about how they assess whether or not to bring such cases to court. They declined to be interviewed but did issue a statement 
which said each case is thoroughly reviewed on its own merits and went on... Proceeding with a prosecution based solely on the word of the complainant presents particular challenges, regardless of when the offending occurred. In all cases, and especially where there has been a significant delay in reporting, prosecutors make sure they do not allow a prosecution where it would be seen as oppressive or unfair and amount to an abusive process of the court. We've been looking for official figures to get some sense of how many historical abuse cases are going through the courts, but it appears that no-one's counting. We did ask the Crown Prosecution Service, but they said there's no specific classification of historic sexual abuse. They would be categorised according to offence, for example, rape or indecent assault, but without reference to when the offence is said to have taken place. Now, does that matter? Well, according to those campaigning for change, it does. The damage to people wrongly convicted is great because, of course, the stain of a sexual allegation never escapes them. Mark Newby, Frank Joynson's solicitor, believes until figures are collated, the authorities have no understanding how significant this issue is. We can only achieve a notional assessment of the scale of the problem, but we look at many, many appeal cases. We have several hundred cases on our books at the moment. I'm sure there are many other lawyers who specialise in appeals in a similar position, and there's clearly a significant problem here, and it's one that needs to be addressed. But if the figures are not being collected, it's not because the authorities haven't been told about the problems in this area, according to former MP Claire Curtis-Thomas. She was a member of the Influential Home Affairs Select Committee in 2002, which looked into the way investigations into abuse in care homes were handled. Its report was highly critical, calling for special safeguards for trials in all historical child abuse cases because of the prejudicial nature of the offences and the serious evidential difficulties. She believes the issue is not being addressed and that justice is falling victim to political expediency. Other ways to keep the prevalence of these cases rising are feminist-promoted educational programs for counselors, social workers, therapists, lawyers, law enforcement, and other institutional platforms that play a role in shaping societal views and laws. Despite the warnings of the Canadian Psychiatry Association and the Canada Psychology Association back in the 1990s, as I described in part two of the series, the Supreme Court of Canada still has not made any rulings in the area of uncorroborated memories of childhood sexual abuse prompted by therapists to curb wrongful convictions. Therefore, convictions still happen, and more often than you probably think. In part four of my series, I will dive into the therapy industry and further analyze the proliferation of dangerous trauma theory, feminist theory, regression therapy techniques, and how they are all allowed to continue to contribute to false accusations and wrongful convictions. So stay tuned.